Welcome to the spring lecture for the Center for Psychological Studies in the Nuclear Age. We're very pleased and proud this evening to have as our spring lecturer uh, Robert McNamara. Um, you're familiar, I know, with some of the things about him, that he was formerly Secretary of Defense and head of the World Bank. But there are some things that I think you're not so familiar with which are the reason that we've invited him to be here with us tonight. What our center is about is trying to discover more about what there is about us as a species that we have bumbled so unthinkingly into the brink or onto the brink of two forms of death, the fast death by nuclear weapons and the slow death by environmental destruction and suffocation. Robert McNamara has been one of those voices of clarity and sanity in relation to the nuclear arms race that have been so rare in our time. For many years, he has recognized that there are no military uses of nuclear weapons, that there's no such thing as advantage when it comes to nuclear devices, that their only value is to prevent their own use. And there's another element which I've noticed in the years that I've known him that has made him a kind of psychological kindred spirit, which is he is unusual uh, when he approaches the political process in looking at how the problem looks from the other guy's point of view. He had the unique experience of looking actually into the nuclear abyss in the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. And he realized then what the experience must have been like for Khrushchev and for the Soviets and realized that our security depends on how we understand the experience from the other side and what the other side might do. For we surely do not want to create fear, as he has observed so many times, in the other side that will lead them to make a preemptive strike. One of his books is called Blundering into Disaster, which gives you a sense of how he thinks and what he's been concerned about. But he has a new book, which hasn't come out yet, in which I think he's kind of beating our center uh, to the punch here. And it's uh, going to be called Out of the Cold, New Thinking for American Foreign and Defense Policy in the 21st Century. Mr. McNamara. Thank you, John. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, unless you think that's an overstatement, I should tell you that I have spent countless hours of absolute ecstasy in this room. The last time I was here, however, was 1943. And I doubt that many of you know that in the early years of this century, the Boston Symphony Orchestra was facing great financial difficulties. And at that time, Harvard University made a substantial financial, at least substantial in those days, contribution to it. And in gratitude, the Boston Symphony then, I don't know whether it still does today, then agreed to give a special series of concerts for Harvard faculty every year. And I was a young faculty member for the years 1940-43, and those concerts were given in this hall. Kusevitsky was then the conductor. And as you know, it's the acoustics are magnificent in this hall, and it's as though you were on the stage with it. So it's a real pleasure to be back. Now, uh, what I am going to engage in tonight is some new thinking. It's very difficult for me. You may think I'm totally incapable of it by the time I finished. I hope not. But in any event, whether you accept my thinking as new or not, I hope it will stimulate some of yours. That's the purpose of the, the statement. And I've titled the, my remarks, uh, Can We End the Cold War? Should we try? So that will be the subject I'll be addressing. And by the Cold War, 
I mean that continuing series of political confrontations, any one of which could have escalated into military conflict with the possibility of literally destroying our civilization. I mean that continuing series of political confrontations, which has existed for over 40 years. It has led to immense expenditures for defense, over $2 trillion alone in the last eight years. It's turned our attention away from our urgent domestic problems. It's distorted our relations with other nations. And I believe it's moved us away from our traditional values. In recent months, General Secretary Gorbachev's statements have confirmed that the costs to the Soviet Union have been at least as great as they have been to this country. On several different occasions, therefore, he has shown a desire to end the conflict. And he stated that war between the superpowers is no longer an acceptable means of achieving political ends. He says, and I use his words, today's problems between East and West must be resolved solely through political means. Now, is a world without the risk of war between East and West an unrealistic hope? Many, I think probably most, students of history and students of geopolitics would say that it is. But I want to ask you, is such a thought any more inconceivable than John Monet's vision of a united Europe or Sadat's initiative to bring peace to Egypt and Israel, or Adenauer and de Gaulle's determination to ensure peaceful relations between France and Germany after several hundred years of war, or the dramatic shifts in U.S. and Japanese relations following World War II, or more recently, the termination of the hostile relationship between the U.S. and the People's Republic of China. Can we visualize a world without the Cold War? What shape would it take? What steps would lead to it? Can we move in that direction without incurring unacceptable risks in the event we fail? And to avoid argument, I'll admit at the start that the burden of proof that we can do that, we can move in that direction without unacceptable risks in the event we fail is on us who propose those changes. And I'll try to prove to you that we can move in that direction and if we fail, we will be none the worse off and I think better off than we are today. Now these are the questions I'll pursue this evening and in the course of doing so I'll first summarize the dramatic shift and it is indeed dramatic in the attitude of the Soviet leaders toward continued conflict with the West. And I'll reflect on the causes of that shift because we must ask ourselves are they likely to continue in that direction and to answer that question one has to understand why they have moved as they have. And then I'll review the Western response to the Soviet initiatives, which I believe have been unimaginative, cautious, and duly skeptical. And I'll propose a far more radical set of moves in both the political and military spheres. And finally, I'll recognize and discuss potential criticisms of the program I outlined, because there are indeed criticisms, and one must recognize them and evaluate them. And I'll conclude that we do indeed face an opportunity. I think it's the greatest in 40 years to bring an end to the Cold War. And to fail to grasp it would mean an indefinite extension of the risk that unintended conflict between East and West will endanger the very survival of our civilization. So let me turn first then to Gorbachev's changes in Soviet policy and comment on their causes. It is clear, I think, that he is attempting to introduce major transformations into Soviet domestic policy and Soviet foreign policy. And among the myriad of changes introduced uh, at his initiative are at least four that bear directly on East-West relations. First, he's launched a fundamental reassessment of the Soviet view of national security and of Soviet geopolitical objectives. Moscow is rapidly moving away from its zero-sum concept of national security. It's beginning to recognize the legitimate security interests of its neighbors and of other states around the globe. Secondly, and this relates to the current restructuring of the Soviet domestic economy, secondly is Moscow's desire to integrate that economy, both technologically and financially, 
into the increasingly interdependent global economy. And thirdly, the General Secretary has introduced preliminary, though I think still significant, liberalization of Soviet human rights laws. And lastly, and related to all three of the above changes, is the remarkable Soviet rejection of a number of very basic Marxist-Leninist ideological views in both the domestic and the foreign policy fields. Before Gorbachev's appointment as General Secretary in March of 1985, Moscow's view of national security appeared to assume that the Soviet Union could guarantee its security only to the extent that other nations felt insecure. And Soviet foreign and defense policy, therefore, was likened to a zero-sum game in which Moscow gained the security lost by others. Since 1985, however, Gorbachev has sought to redefine Soviet perceptions of national security. And he's introduced his new thinking. And that new thinking on foreign policy features at least three concepts which are strongly at odds with traditional Marxist-Leninist views. First, he says, a nation's security interest should be pursued through diplomacy, not through the threat of the use of military force, and certainly not through the use of military force. And secondly, that one nation's security cannot be guaranteed at the expense of the security of others. Security cannot be pursued unilaterally. It must be strengthened in cooperation with other states. And thirdly, that international organizations and bilateral efforts can serve to solve regional and global problems. Gorbachev has consistently repeated each of these themes in speeches, articles, and press conferences during the four years that have elapsed since uh, he took office. And the point he returns to more than any other when he's discussing foreign policy is this. It's his belief that modern military technology, particularly as applies to nuclear weapons, but also advanced technology applying to conventional weapons, modern military technology has rendered war an inadmissible means of advancing a nation's security interests. And he says, in his words, there's a lack of proportionality in nuclear war. And by that, he simply means the destruction would far outweigh any conceivable political gain. And he goes on to say that any war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union would contain within it the seeds of a possible unlimited nuclear war. Now, what's the origin of the new thinking? As I suggested, we're to answer the question, is it a passing phase? We should examine why he's doing what he's doing. And I think there are two forces that have led to the fundamental change in Soviet views of their relationship with the West. The first is the obvious one. We talk of it every day. The countries, the Soviet Union's economic crisis, it's far more severe than many of us in the West realized. The GNP growth rate in the Soviet Union approximated 6% per annum during the 1960s, 4% per annum in the 70s, 2% per annum in the early years of 80s, and it's been stagnant in the last several years. And the effects of that stagnant economy have been reflected in basic measures of social welfare. For example, life expectancy has fallen, infant mortality has risen, alcoholism has increased, and the Soviet press reported a few months ago that the quantity of food available to the average Soviet citizen today is less than it was in 1915 under the czars. Now, Gorbachev is aware of these conditions. In Perestroika, the book, the book he wrote, he speaks of a society in crisis, and he recognizes that it will be difficult, if not impossible, to finance the investment required to expand productivity and to make the Soviet Union into a strong competitor in the global market in the 21st century without reducing the inordinately high level of defense expenditures. In contrast to the 6% of GNP which we spend on defense, the Soviet Union today is probably spending on the order of 17% of GNP for defense. That's the CIA estimate. There are some Soviet scholars in this country, particularly Harry Rowan at Stanford, who believes that the defense expenditure amounts to something on the order of 21 to 24 percent of GNP. In any event, they are an example of a great power 
as is implied in Paul Kennedy's book, The Rise and Fall of Great Powers. They are an example of a great power in which economic strength and security commitments are out of balance. To strengthen the economy, defense outlays in relation to GNP must be reduced. But to reduce defense outlays without increasing security risks, without reducing security, requires a reduction in the political conflict between East and West and a start on winding down the arms race. So that, I believe, is the first reason for his new thinking. But there's a second reason as well, and it's one that isn't often recognized. At the same time that domestic economic problems are pushing Gorbachev to search for ways to reduce East-West conflict, he's come to recognize the increasing danger of military action in this nuclear age. The Soviets have studied the origin and the implications of the continuing confrontations between East and West. For example, over Berlin, over the Cuban missiles, over the Middle East. And they have recognized, perhaps more than we, the great danger that through misinformation, misjudgment, miscalculation, these crises may escalate. And in this connection, let me tell you of a meeting that I attended in Moscow uh, a few weeks ago. The Soviet government, in association with this university, invited uh, McGeorge Bundy, who had been Kennedy's national security advisor, Ted Sorensen, who was Kennedy's personal assistant, and me to meet with a number of Russians, including uh, Gromyko, who had been their foreign minister for some 30 years and at his time of retirement was deputy prime minister, uh, and uh, Anatoly Dobrynin, for 25 years their ambassador to this country, Fyodor Berlatsky, who at the time of the missile crisis in 1962 was Khrushchev's personal assistant, along with three Cuban officials who are today and were in 1962 very, very close associates of, Ca of Fidel Castro. And they invited us there to discuss the causes of the missile crisis and to examine the lessons to be learned from that event. You may recall that in 1962, the Soviet Union, under the cloak of secrecy and with a clear intent to deceive, introduced uh, intermediate range nuclear missiles into Cuba. And a series of actions followed, which brought the US and the Soviet Union to the brink of, of military confrontation and the world to the brink of nuclear disaster. And at the Moscow meeting, the Soviets spoke with extraordinary candor. In their words, Khrushchev acted in a spirit of adventurism and without consideration of the consequences. And that was a severe damnation. It was meant to be a severe damnation by them of the action taken by their leader. But I believe more fundamentally, Khrushchev did what he did. Kennedy responded as he did. Because each leader, their associates and their peoples were captives of gross misperceptions and very, very deep-seated mistrust, which underlay the Cold War. Misperceptions and mistrust, which to a considerable degree exist to this day. In addition, it is now clear that at the time, the decisions of each side, before the crisis and during the crisis, were distorted by misinformation and miscalculation. And let me give you four examples of that. First, before the Soviets introduced the missiles into Cuba in 1962, the Soviets and the Cubans believed that the United States intended to invade that island overthrow Castro, destroy his government. But I can say without any qualification whatsoever, we had no such intention. Secondly, the U.S. believed that the Soviets would not move nuclear weapons, nuclear warheads, off the soil of the Soviet Union, but they did. In Moscow, we were told that by October 24, 1962, 20 Soviet nuclear warheads had been delivered to Cuba and their missiles were targeted on U.S. cities in the East Coast. Thirdly, the Soviets believed the missiles could be introduced secretly into Cuba without detection by the United States, and that when their presence was disclosed to the U.S., as the Soviets intended to do shortly after the election in November 1962, when their presence was disclosed to the U.S., we would not respond. Here, too, they were in error. And finally, those who urged President Kennedy to destroy the missiles by an air attack, which it was recognized would almost surely lead to a land and sea invasion, were almost certainly mistaken in their belief 
that the Soviets would not respond with military action. At the time, the CIA estimated that the Soviets had 10,000 military troops in Cuba. We were told in Moscow there were 40,000 Soviet troops there. We were told also there were 270,000 well-armed Cuban troops. And the commanders, the Soviet and Cuban military commanders, told us their forces were determined to fight, in their words, to the death. And the, and the Cubans told us they estimated they would suffer 100,000 casualties. We had estimated 25,000. The Soviets expressed disbelief that we would have thought, in the face of such a catastrophic defeat imposed by us on them, that they would not have responded militarily somewhere in the world. And when we asked where, they said most likely against U.S. Jupiter missiles, nuclear missiles in, in Turkey, or against NATO forces in Berlin. By September, October 27, 1962, the crisis had reached such a point that Berlatsky, Khrushchev's assistant, reported to us that he and a Central Committee staff colleague had decided to move their wives and children out of Moscow into the countryside because of their fear of an imminent U.S. nuclear strike on the capital. And at the same time in Washington, on a perfectly beautiful fall evening, as I was leaving the President's Oval Office to return to the Pentagon, I thought I might never live to see another Saturday evening. Now, I know that sounds melodramatic, but it reflects the state of mind of the participants on both sides of the conflict at that critical moment in the crisis. Now, what were the lessons learned? We agreed there were two. First, in this nuclear age, crisis management is difficult, dangerous, uncertain. It is not possible to predict with confidence the consequences of military action between the, the superpowers because of misinformation, miscalculation, misjudgment. And therefore, we must direct our attention to crisis avoidance. And that means reducing political tensions between East and West, and that can only be done by striking at the misperceptions and the mistrust that feed such tensions. And I submit to you that in the 26 years that have passed since the missile crisis, we've made, in my opinion, very little progress in that direction. But I believe today we face an unparalleled opportunity to probe, and I use the verb probe intentionally. We face an unparalleled opportunity to probe the extent to which major steps can be taken to shrink dramatically the basis for East-West conflict. Now, as I said at the beginning, Western reactions, particularly those of the U.S., to Gorbachev's proposals for changes in East-West political and military relations have, I think, been skeptical, cautious, unimaginative. But perhaps at this stage, only 48 months after Gorbachev came on the scene, that's to be expected. For 40 years, our foreign policy and our defense programs have been shaped largely by one major force, fear of and opposition to the spread of Soviet-sponsored communism. It will require a leap of the imagination for us to conceive of our national goals, to conceive of our role in a world which is not dominated by that struggle between East and West. In the immediate post-war years, we viewed the world as composed of a group of Western nations devastated by war, colonial nations in Africa and Asia straining for freedom, developing countries every, everywhere struggling to advance, and all of these groups endangered by the two great communist powers, China and the Soviet Union. And we saw them as determined to extend their hegemony across the globe. And in that world, we viewed ourselves as a generous benefactor of the poor, a source of aid to the nation seeking to recover from the war, the protector of freedom and democracy everywhere, and the defender of all against the communist threat. And fearing that threat, we developed in the U.S. and with our allies, a massive military force. We forged alliances with nations of both the Western world and between North and South, and we supplied economic and military assistance to anti-communist regimes across the globe. The opposition between East and West has continued to dominate the world political scene, and neither national political policies nor international institutions have yet adjusted to the possibility of a termination of that Cold War. And neither national nor international leaders have yet, have yet conceived of the world that would result, or how to realize and catalyze movement toward it. 
The world of today is still organized to reflect the rivalry. Indeed, I think it's correct to say to reflect the enmity between the socialist and the capitalist camps. So before we can respond to Gorbachev, we need a vision of a world which would not be dominated by that enmity. It wouldn't be a world without conflict, conflict between nations and conflict within nations. Racial and ethnic differences will remain. Political revolutions will erupt as societies advance. Historical disputes over political boundaries will continue. And economic differentials among nations as the technological revolution of the 21st century sweeps unevenly across the globe will increase. So in those respects, the world of the future will not be different from the world of the past. Conflicts within nations and conflicts between nations will not disappear. But how different that world would be if the superpowers agreed on two points. First, that neither would seek to take advantage of such disputes to increase their political or military power or to extend their political or military power beyond their borders. And secondly, that their bilateral relations would be conducted according to rules of conduct which precluded the use of force. No leader of East or West, and no scholar so far as I know, has sketched out how the nations of East and West and of North and South might relate to each other in such a world, or how they could move toward it through a series of steps which almost surely would have to extend over a period of years, very likely a decade or two. I'll try to do so. I'll deal first with political actions, later with changes in military forces. And I realize that this is a simplistic way of looking at the problem. I do so simply to facilitate discussion. As a matter of fact, there will be a synergism between political actions and military actions, and actions in the two spheres must be carried on concurrently. But first, dealing with political actions. It is, I think, clear that in the 21st century, regardless of actions by the Soviet Union and the U.S., relations among nations will differ dramatically from those of the post-war decades. In the post-war years, the U.S. had the power, and to a considerable degree, we exercised it, to shape the world as we chose. In the next century, whether or not the Cold War ends, that will not be possible. While remaining, and I believe we will remain, the world's strongest nation, we'll live in a multipolar world, and our foreign policy and our defense programs must be adjusted to that reality. We've already seen the rise of Japan. We must expect it to play a larger and a larger role on the world scene. It will exercise greater and greater political power, and hopefully it will assume greater political and economic responsibility. The same can be said of Western Union, Western Europe, which will take a massive step toward economic integration in 1992. It may not complete it for some years after, until some years after that, but it will be a major step forward. And from that is bound to follow greater political unity, which will strengthen Europe's power in, in world politics. And by the middle of next century, several of the countries of what we now think of as the third world will have so increased in size and economic power as to be major participants in decisions affecting, affecting relations among nations. <coughs> India will have a population of 1 billion 600 million, Nigeria 400 million, Brazil 300 million. And if China achieves its economic goals for the year 2000, it is well on the way to doing so. And if it then advances economically at satisfactory but not spectacular rates for the decades after that, by mid-century, its income per capita will equal that of the British in 1965, and its GNP as a whole will approximate that of the U.S. or Western Europe or Japan, and surely will exceed that of the Soviet Union. Now, these figures are, of course, highly speculative. I point to them simply to emphasize the magnitude of the changes which lie ahead and the need to adjust our goals, our policies, our institutions to take account of those changes. In such a multipolar world, neither the U.S. nor the Soviet Union would be able to so completely dominate their respective spheres as at present. And with or without changes in relations between East and West, the U.S. must prepare itself politically for a new role in that new world. There clearly is need to develop a new relationship both between East and West and between North and South. And at a minimum, such relationship should cover four points. First, it should guarantee the military neutrality of the third world. 
Secondly, it should, commit, it should commit the superpowers to sharp reductions in and ultimately termination of military support of conflicts between third world nations. And thirdly, it should assure a system of cooperative security for the nations of the South and a, a mechanism for resolution of regional conflicts without superpower involvement. And finally, it should provide much greater assistance than at present to the developing countries to help them accelerate their rates of economic and social advance. Agreement by East and West to support such a program would not only represent adjustment to the reality of economic and political change in the third world, but it would be consistent with moves to dampen down and ultimately to terminate the Cold War. It would be a return to Roosevelt's and Churchill's conception of the post-war world, a conception which you may recall was first put forward in the Atlantic Charter in 1941 and was then expanded uh, in 1944 into a proposal for establishment of the United Nations. And those two proposals, when they were, for were formulated, were uncontaminated by the ideology of the Cold War, which didn't uh, begin to take hold until 1945 and 1946. To implement the UN Charter, to maintain post-war order, Roosevelt was increasingly attracted to the concept of an international organization. And he, re he, re he reasoned that in the past, American isolation and neutrality had failed to keep the peace. And he had no faith either in isolation. And therefore, with no faith in isolation, neutrality, or balance of power arrangements, he saw no alternative to international cooperation. But his hopes for a strong united organization that would defend a single interpretation of the post-war order were, of course, uh, not to be fulfilled. Because by the time the UN was organized, East-West rivalry had rendered it impotent. But isn't it time to return to Roosevelt's conception of a world in which order would be maintained through international cooperation, through support for a multilateral institution or institutions, the United Nations and the regional organizations? To move toward Roosevelt's vision, shouldn't East and West agree on a code of conduct to cover relations between themselves and between them and other nations? Such a code would be based on the belief that each bloc's political interests should be pursued through diplomacy, not through military threats, not through the use of force, but through support of collective security arrangements. Had there been such a code of conduct, it would have precluded such unilateral post-war actions as Soviet intervention in Afghanistan, Angola, Indochina, Korea. It would have precluded U.S. intervention in Vietnam, Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, Grenada, the Persian Gulf, and it would have precluded as well British and French intervention in Egypt. So much for the political actions. While steps are being taken to reduce the danger of East-West political conflict, the arms control negotiations now underway should be expanded in scope and they should be accelerated in time. There should be both long-term, object uh, short-term objectives, a short-term agenda and a long-term agenda. And the short-term arms negotiation agenda should stress early completion of the START Treaty, rapid progress toward the restructuring and the balancing of NATO and Warsaw Pact forces in Europe at lower levels, substantially lower levels than at present, and large reductions in tactical nuclear forces. Such a short-term program would greatly improve crisis stability. But after it was completed, and I think it could be completed by roughly 1995, NATO and the Warsaw Pact will retain thousands of nuclear warheads, and NATO strategy will continue to be based on the first use of those weapons under certain circumstances. So the danger of nuclear war, the risk of destruction of our society, will have been reduced, but it won't have been eliminated. Now, can we go further? Surely the answer must be yes. More and more political and military leaders are accepting that major changes in NATO's nuclear strategy are required. Some, by no means a majority, but some are going so far as to state that our long-term objective should be to return insofar as practical to a non-nuclear world. 
As a matter of fact, Gorbachev has proposed that the U.S. and the Soviet Union aim at achieving the total elimination of nuclear weapons by the year 2000. But the genie is out of the bottle. We cannot remove from men's minds the knowledge of how to build nuclear weapons. And therefore, unless technologies and procedures can be developed to ensure detection of any steps toward building even a single nuclear weapon by any nation or any terrorist group, and I think such safeguards are not on the horizon, unless they were possible, an agreement for total nuclear disarmament will almost certainly degenerate into an unstable rearmament race. And thus, despite what appears to me to be the desirability of a world without nuclear weapons, an agreement to that end does not appear feasible either today or for the foreseeable future. But if NATO and the Warsaw Pact and the other nuclear powers, particularly France, Britain, and China, were to agree in principle that each nation's nuclear force would be no larger than was needed to deter cheating, that is to say, deter secretly building nuclear weapons in violation of an agreement not to do so, how large might such a force be, the deterrent force? Policing an arms agreement that restricted each side to a small number of weapons is quite feasible with current verification technology. The number of warheads required for a force sufficiently large to deter cheating would be determined by the number that one's opponent could build in secret without detection. Now, I know of no studies which point to what that number might be. The very fact that there aren't any indicates how little thought has been given to this subject. But surely the number wouldn't exceed a few hundred, say at most 500, and very possibly it could be far less, possibly in the tens. Such an agreement could be achieved only over a period of years, possibly by the year 2000. But shouldn't we set it as our ultimate objective? And shouldn't we lay out a series of steps to move toward it? As we move in that direction, and as we complete as well Gorbachev's plan for restructuring and reducing conventional forces, I believe that U.S. De defense budgets can be reduced significantly. I think if we are to proceed down that path and if we proceed successfully, we can, within six to eight years, cut U.S. defense budgets, U.S. defense expenditures as a percent of GNP roughly in half, say from 6% of G GNP to 3%. And in 1989 dollars and 1989 GNP, that would mean a reduction of $150 billion per year, which could be spent on addressing the very, very severe human and physical infrastructure needs of both our nation and the nations in the third world. So much for the vision. There are very serious criticisms that can be made of what I have outlined as a desired program. After 40 years, any attempt to shift relations between East and West, as dramatically as is implied by a program to end the Cold War, is by, very, is by, is by its very nature uncertain of accomplishment, potentially risky, and likely to be highly controversial. And I can think of six major criticisms, very severe criticisms, that could be made of what I have proposed. Each of these is worthy of consideration. In my opinion, each can be rebutted. I'm not going to take the time tonight to lay them out for you or to rebut them, with one exception. I want to deal with one that's commonly that you hear every day. Gorbachev is likely to fail, and if he fails, his successor will reverse his policies, placing a complacent West in a position of inferiority. Now, I think it's probably correct to say that the majority of U.S. Soviet scholars believe that Gorbachev will fail. As a mar matter of fact, Marshall Goldman, who, as you may know, is associate director of Harvard's uh, Russian Research Center, has expressed this sentiment, when he, and he has said in his words, I think Gorbachev has about a year left. And at least some Soviet officials are equally pessimistic. But while noting the difficulties that Gorbachev faces, we should recognize that he has diagnosed the problem correctly. They are in a hell of a mess. And there's no alternative, in my opinion, to his political and economic reforms. If long-term economic crises 
and result in political disorders are to be avoided. So if Gorbachev fails, and they may, and he may, his successor will face the same problems, and to solve them, he'll ultimately have to move to the same solutions. Now, it's correct to say that that successor may take a step back. He may conjure up foreign devils to focus the attention of his people, to unite them in support of whatever policies he proposes to introduce, and that may pose a risk for us. But in the long run, in my opinion, he'll move to the same program that Gorbachev has laid down, and it's very likely, therefore, that for the next decade or two, the Soviet Union will move in the direction laid down by the General Secretary. But suppose I'm wrong. Suppose that isn't the case. Suppose that there is a collapse of perestroika, both nationally and internationally, and a resumption of political conflict and military confrontation. Can we protect ourselves against such an eventuality? I think the answer is clearly yes. As nuclear arms agreements bring reductions in nuclear forces and add to crisis stability, and they will, there need never be a weakening of our nuclear deterrent. And concurrently with the changes in the nuclear forces, it appears very likely that through both unilateral actions of the kind Gorbachev's already taken and through bilateral agreements, the present numerical superiority and offensive capability of Warsaw Pact conventional forces will be reduced. We're bound to benefit from that. And in addition, there's a high probability that we can agree on what are known as confidence-building measures, which will greatly reduce the danger to the West of surprise attack. So together, these actions should give the West high confidence that we can move down a path which provides hope for termination of the Cold War without incurring unacceptable risks in the event we fail to achieve that objective. As I began these remarks, I pointed out that the Cold War, this continuing series of political conflicts, each one of which carried with it the risk of escalating to military conflict, has existed for over 40 years. It's inconceivable to me that we should be content to continue on this present path of East-West confrontation for another 40 years. The risks of military conflict with disastrous consequences to our society and the dangers, as a matter of fact, the dangers of erosion of public support for such a policy are increasingly great. We in the West do have an opportunity. As I've said, I think it's the greatest since the end of World War II. We do have an opportunity to formulate and to seek to establish a new relationship. We can do so from a position of strength. If our hopes aren't realized, we'll have lost nothing. If we succeed, we can enter the 21st century with a far more stable political relationship between East and West, with a totally different military strategy, one of mutual security instead of war fighting, with a vastly smaller nuclear force, a few hundreds in place of 50,000, and with conventional forces in balance and in defensive rather than offensive postures, and therefore with a dramatically lower risk that our nation will be destroyed by unintended conflict. And with such a change in East-West relations, the long-term outlook for the United States will be brighter, I believe, than at any time in this century. As a nation, we are in the forefront of technological change, and we do have the largest common market in the world, a market of 50 states, in effect, 50 nations. And we do possess a flexible, skilled, highly mobile labor force albeit in need of large investments in continuing education and training. We do have strong capital markets. We have adventuresome entrepreneurs. We have stable political institutions. And with these strengths, the U.S. is uniquely situated to move into the 21st century as the strongest of nations in a multipolar world, a world in which there will be a far lower risk of war than at present. I think it is true, as Paul Kennedy says, that in the 21st century, the relative power of the U.S. will be less. But no nation will have greater power. And in absolute terms, will be far stronger, far stronger economically, socially, politically, psychologically. And there need then be no divergence, as I believe there has been, between our ideals, between our belief in representative government, individual liberty, economic and social advance of all our peoples. No divergence between those ideals on the one hand <clears throat> and our international behavior. 
If the U.S. and its allies are bold, if together we dare break out of the mindsets of the past four decades, we can help reshape international institutions as well as relations among nations. And we do, can do so in ways which will lead to a far more peaceful world and a far more prosperous world for the nations of both East and West and North and South. And surely that must be our objective. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Bob. Uh, my first question, uh, first question, which I'll take the privilege of asking you. I'm John Mack, by the way. I'm uh, academic director of the center. Uh, this relates to uh, your observations that you've made a number of times that our response to the Soviet initiatives, uh, to Mr. Gorbachev's uh, dramatic changes, has been uh, too slow or insufficient. Now, in comments at Harvard Kennedy School, uh, Andrei Kortunov of the Soviet Institute for the Study of the United States and Canada reflected on Gorbachev's December 7th address to the United Nations. He attributed the breaking of new ground in that address, the recognition of global interconnectedness, to a process of political maturation. That was his term. And he said this. He said, we have lost the arrogance of power typical of every young dynamic nation. Khrushchev came to the United Nations as a soldier against imperialism. Gorbachev came as an engineer to construct a new world order. We lost our ideological zeal and gained political responsibilities. Our world is united, not divided into hostile systems. We learned the hard way in the high seas of the Caribbean, the streets of Prague, the mountains of Afghanistan, the conference tables of Moscow, and the rice fields of Russia. We learned for all mankind what it has not been easy for mankind to know. Now, my question is, uh, do you think that there is something in the American psyche or the American political culture which makes it particularly difficult for us to learn in the way that Kortunov was describing, to grow in terms of political maturity, to change the way we are? My God, that's a question for you. You're, you're the psychiatrist, not I. You know, psychiatrists always just ask questions. We never give answers. Uh, well, I'm foolish enough to try to answer it. Uh, in the first place, I don't believe it's political maturation of a young society, as apparently he, he indicated. I think it's a necessity. Breaking out of mindsets is very, very difficult. At least it is for me. And I don't think I'm unique in that respect. I think it's difficult for the Soviets to break out of mindsets. And they had a mindset. And, you know, if I look back at how they thought and why they thought it, uh, I can understand how that mindset developed. I'll just give you one illustration. We think of them as always aggressive. They are the ones that consistently threatened the West. We never threatened them. There was no basis whatsoever for building up the military power they did. Now, without in any way justifying their political behavior, don't misunderstand me. I don't want to get an argument on this point. But I do want to stress this. If you'd been there, if you'd been sitting where they sat, and you'd seen what we were doing, and you knew what we were thinking, or what some of us were thinking, you'd have been scared to death. And I'll give you one illustration. We had, in the early 1960s, on the order of 5,000 nuclear warheads, nu strategic nuclear warheads, so there are roughly 300. And while well, President Kennedy and I did not believe that gave us a first strike capability, there were individuals in the U.S. who thought it did and in any event said we should have one. If we didn't have one there, for God's sakes, let's get more and, and have one. And this was rather common knowledge in the halls of the Pentagon. And moreover, it was even in writing. A, uh, a reporter came to me two or three years ago, and he said, what have you got to say about this? And it was a, a very highly classified document that I had written for President Kennedy, labeled Top Secret Eyes Only. And in it, I said, it was dated uh, November 1962, and in it I said, it was related to the 
the budget that was to go to the Congress in 1963. And in it I said, Mr. President, uh, I am recommending X for uh, strategic forces. And this is contrary to the recommendations from the Air Force. The Air Force believes we have or, sh or can attain and should have a first strike capability and therefore they, they, represented, they recommended 3X. And I think they're wrong, putting moral considerations aside. I don't believe we have or should have or can attain a first strike capability and therefore I strongly recommend against it. I said, my God, how'd you get hold of that? He said, well, under the Freedom of Information Act, I forced its declassification through a court. Now, the Soviets didn't see that piece of paper in 1962, I'm sure of that. But the piece of paper reflected the conventional thinking at that time among some people. And I'm certain the Soviets knew that. Now, if you'd been sitting in their shoes and you saw we had 5,000 to their 300, wouldn't that have affected your behavior? And if that had gone on for 20 years, wouldn't you have some mindsets? And I think they have had it. And I don't think it's, quote, political maturation of a young state at all that caused them to change, not a bit. It's necessity. It's some education, I'll come to in a minute, or some maturation, but it's the economic necessity. They cannot address their underlying economic problems without a shift in resources. Now, that's not enough. It's not a sufficient, but it's an absolutely necessary condition. And in a sense, it gives me heart, because as I suggest to you, if Gorbachev fails, and he may, he may fail in the sense that it's going to be very, very difficult to show to the Soviet people substantial economic advance quickly, and they may not be patient enough to wait them out to get the reform, get the, get the uh, benefits, which I think ultimately will result. The Soviets have followed quite a different policy than the Chinese. In 1979, when I was meeting with Deng Xiaoping to negotiate the re-entry of the People's Republic into the World Bank, Deng Xiaoping told me that they were going to introduce their responsibility system, which is their perestroika, first in the agricultural sector. Why? Because difficult as it is to change policies, economic policies, to restructure an agricultural sector, it's a heck of a lot easier to do it there than in the industrial sector. He did. He introduced it there in 79, from 79 to 84. He had an increase in agricultural output of roughly 8% a year cumulative. So, and that filtered through the whole society. And by 84, he had provided to almost every Chinese citizen, rural and urban alike, a tremendous increment of gain. And that today, even in spite of all the riots, that today is, is a foundation for support of his people at a time when they are beginning to see some of the costs of restructuring, the corruption, the inflation, the unemployment, the income inequalities. But they have a gain. So most of them will go along with it, I suspect. In the Soviet Union, they don't have the gain. He didn't introduce it first into the agricultural sector. Perhaps he thought he couldn't. In any case, he didn't. And they don't have a great gain. And it's going to be difficult to get one. And if he doesn't get one, the people may lose faith in him, lose confidence in him. But I come back to the point, I don't think it's political maturation. It's economic necessity, number one. Number two, as was implied by one term that you referred to, I think he said something about Caribbean experience. I do think the Cuban experience of the kind I outlined to you has had a major impact on their thinking. It should have on ours. Suppose we had struck Cuba as many of us wanted to. At one point, I think the majority of the members of the executive committee advising President Kennedy, the majority at one point wanted to see the U.S. strike Cuba with an airstrike later to be followed by a land and sea invasion. Suppose we'd done so. And suppose the Soviets had responded militarily as in Moscow a few weeks ago they indicated they would, would have. How would we have responded? Suppose they'd struck Turkey. Where does it end? Who knows? Who wants to start down that path in a world of 50,000 nuclear weapons? I don't. I don't believe they do. We shouldn't. And we ought to reduce the risk of doing so. Okay. Uh, I'm going to call on uh, Hugh Gusterson for the next question. Uh, Hugh is... Uh, anthropologist uh, who is currently studying the Livermore Laboratories as a uh, uh, 
culture and uh, a place for field work. Uh, and Hugh is a fellow of our center. Hugh. I have a question along somewhat similar lines. Uh, I'm struck by the paradox that uh, such daring and dramatic proposals to end the Cold War should have come from the Soviet Union, from a bureaucracy that we've come to regard as corrupt and ossified. And we meanwhile have the spectacle of uh, a dynamic, creative democracy like the Soviet Union, like, like the um, United States, uh, appearing embarrassed um, and stalling uh, in the face of these creative kinds of proposals. Uh, and I'm wondering, uh, you mentioned the term mindsets. I wanted to direct your attention more to certain institutional arrangements in this society. I was wondering, to what extent do you think that has to do with the enormous and powerful vested interests in this country that President Eisenhower warned us against, uh, which rely on the Cold War to sustain their power and their influence? I'm wondering how you think a wise leader in this country would deal with the opposition that those vested interests might mount uh, against the program of ending the Cold War, and how such a leader would deal with the economic dislocation which might ensue uh, from the diminishment of uh, military spending? Well, first, uh, in a sense, I think uh, these revolutionary changes that we've referred to that Gorbachev has put forward may well be easier in uh, a, a non-democratic society. Uh, it, it's fascinating to me to speculate on how Gorbachev uh, came to where he is, holding the ideas he does. And I've never really heard from Soviet scholars or anyone else a really good explanation of that. I think it's very, very clear that he's not the first person to hold those ideas. Uh, and Dropoff, for example, apparently had uh, somewhat similar thoughts and was beginning to move in that direction. And, and to a considerable degree, Gorbachev, I guess, is a protege of and Dropoff. But uh, in any event, it's remarkable that those ideas did develop in a man who ultimately became a leader. But having developed in a man who became a leader, I can see how one could uh, introduce those more quickly, more forcefully, in uh, a dictatorship than in a democracy. Uh, a political leader in our society is limited to, by uh, public opinion. If you don't believe so, try to run in this state without opposing a tax increase. You know, if you want to look at an interesting election, look at Elliot Richardson's primary campaign. He probably could have been elected in the general election. Hell, he couldn't get the Republican nomination because his opponent said to him, I defy you to state publicly that under all circumstances you will oppose a tax increase. Elliot refused to do that. He lost the primary. So it is difficult for political leaders in our society to move unless there's some basis of consensus behind them. Now, I don't agree at all that the military-industrial complex, and I think that's what you were alluding to, is a restraint on a president. I'm not certain of what I'm about to say, but I have heard it said by people who should know that those words, the military-industrial complex, were inserted into that Eisenhower speech toward the end of his second term uh, by a speechwriter. I don't believe at all that Eisenhower felt constrained by the military-industrial complex. He felt perfectly confident of his judgment versus theirs. And to the extent that his judgment was supported by the people, as contrasted to the military-industrial complex, I don't think he would have hesitated to move in opposition to the military-industrial complex. Certainly Kennedy didn't. We canceled the B-70 aircraft project when there were 40,000 people working on it in 24 states and it was when it was fully supported by the Senate and House Armed Services Committees, by the appropriation committees of both houses, and by the majority of the Senate senators and congressmen. And we and clearly it was uh, supported by the military industrial complex. We canceled it. And it's stayed canceled. So I think that the institutional arrangements or the institutional structure of our society as contrasted for the minute with, with this democratic uh, population and set of democratic institutions that we have, the institutional structure is not a major, major limiting force. 
But the mindsets of our people are limiting. I do not believe that today congressmen who in opposition to one party, in opposition to the president, vote for a tax increase and vote to eliminate, uh, or to, I shouldn't say eliminate, to limit Social Security benefits, even to the extent of just taxing them, much less reducing the cost of living uh, formula. I do not believe they can be reelected. And uh, yet I tell you that from the point of view of equity and from the point of view of economic necessity, we must move and ultimately will move in those directions. What's stopping it? Not institutions, certainly not the military industrial complex, but rather a general feeling of lack of consensus and support of them. It's a very powerful force. And in this situation, therefore, we must try to move our people. And we must hope that our political leaders will give guidance and direction to this effort. We must try to move our people to recognize both the danger of the past 40 years and the opportunity to move away from it in the next 40 years. And that's what we have presidents for. Roosevelt was right. The presidency is a bully pulpit. We need to use it for that. Um, I'd like to congratulate you and thank you for that brilliant statement of a response to Gorbachev that's worthy of the name. I suspect that many of the people here in the auditorium fully support the vision that you outlined, as I certainly do. And so I would like to follow up on the two questions you've already been asked by asking if you could think with us a little bit more out loud about the process by which the United States might come to take the kind of leadership role that you described and that it could take. And uh, let, let me just add a few more dimensions to that question, that same question that I've really heard from the two previous questioners. Um, although we have seen individual weapon systems stopped in the United States over the last several decades, uh, several by President Carter, we haven't seen a president who was free to cut more than two or three, maybe five percent of military spending, the most we got at the end of the Vietnam War, uh, because there was that lack of consensus. We don't have political parties like there are in Europe, which seem to be able to devise new party platforms on which the president and members of Congress can run. Somehow, the political leadership of the country, both the executive and the Congress, seem to be on the defensive on this issue. It's very hard for the United States, perhaps because it is number one, I think to stand up and say there is a better way, a different way, not just in terms of one weapon system or 2% of the military budget, but in terms of the basic way that the international system is being run. I think that the challenge you've held out is far greater than any this country has faced since World War II. And I wonder if you could help us think about a process by which the kind of leadership we need might come about. Well, we, we have uh, uh, an administration which is elected for at least four years, and a House for two, and a Senate for, uh, for a longer period. So we, we have the people on the scene right now that are going to have to deal with this in the near term. And I'm moderately optimistic that they'll uh, deal with it uh, effectively. I've said rather facetiously, but, but, but with some truth behind it, I believe, that Gorbachev may save us from ourselves. And, and, and I don't say that facetiously. I don't say it in a smart-alecky fashion. But it's, if I'm correct in believing that he's moving from necessity, that he's got to do what he's doing. As a matter of fact, one of his people said to me last week, he said, you know, whether or not you uh, go along with some of these things, we're going to do them anyhow. Now, let me digress a moment. I'll get back to the question because it's a very good question. But let me digress a moment to say that I don't believe most of us understand that military parity is not a level playing. It's a band. 
and the band has width. And as long as your forces in relation to your opponents lie within the limits of that band, you have equivalent security with what you would have at any other positions in the band. And I think Gorbachev understands that. And that's why he gave up four weapons, four warheads, four nuclear warheads, to every one of ours in the INF Treaty. And that's why on December 7th he said to the UN, I am taking 500,000 men and 10,000 tanks out of my forces. And that's why he had Chevronazzi say last week, I'm taking 500 nuclear warheads out, because he, he continues to lie within that band. And I think we're going to learn that lesson fairly soon. I don't think we understand it quite as clearly as he does yet. But there are opportunities for us to move in that direction. In any event, he's drawing us along. Now, I think it is true that he gains in terms of propaganda advantage when he makes these moves and we don't respond. But quite frankly, I don't think that's his objective. I don't think he's fighting a propaganda war here. It's much more serious for him. It is a war to reorganize his own society. And it's very, very difficult. And he must do what he's doing. And I think it's going to ultimately draw us along. And I suggest, to answer your question, that we should move on two fronts concurrently, the political front and the arms control front, because they will, there will be that synergistic relationship. And some progress on one will give us greater confidence to move on the other. And let me illustrate by saying this. I think we have been paranoid. And when I say we, I don't mean the Reagan administration. I mean all of us. And for a long period of time in this country, paranoid about Soviet penetration of this hemisphere. How can you explain our actions, some of which I was part of, against Cuba, for example, the Bay of Pigs in the early 60s? How can you explain that the majority of the American people believed that Nicaragua was a security risk? How can you explain that? Now, there was never any indication that we thought it was a security risk because the Soviets were going to put offensive arms there. The Soviets, in effect, were prohibited from and agreed not to introduce offensive arms into this hemisphere as a result of the agreement to terminate the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 62. And since that time, with a few minor uh, actions on the fringes, there's been no introduction of Soviet offensive arms in the hemisphere. There never should be any. If there is any, we ought to just destroy it. And we have the power to do so. Now, assuming for the minute there are no offensive arms in the hemisphere. How the hell can you think of Nicaragua as a security risk? But we did. Maybe you in the room didn't. But if you didn't, you're unique because the majority of American people did. Go back and read the Kissinger Commission report and read the names of the individuals who signed that. Those were responsible citizens. They were wise individuals. I think they were totally wrong. But that doesn't mean they weren't responsible. It doesn't mean they weren't wise. It just means they were captives of this mindset. Now, what I wish to suggest to you is, I think we have an opportunity to break out of that. And if you read carefully what Baker reported of his meeting with, with uh, both Shevardnadze and Gorbachev last week in Moscow, I think you'll see the beginning of it. And you'll see the beginning in an extremely important area, the Western Hemisphere. What he says is, what he said to the press was, we discussed regional conflicts. We discussed superpower intervention in regional conflicts. And in effect, these aren't quite his words, but in effect, we began to move toward a recognition that neither one of us should intervene in regional conflicts and that the Soviets, neither directly nor indirectly, should support subversion of established governments in the hemisphere. Now, if you could move further down that path, it will give us immense confidence that the Soviets are moving toward change. And if at the same time we move forward on start, it's going to be difficult, it's not going to come soon, but I would think the probabilities are very high we'll have a start agreement within two years, and that will be not a 50 percent reduction, it will be 35 or 40 percent, and more importantly, it will be a move toward increasing crisis stability. If in, during that same period we make progress, I don't think we'll have an agreement, but if we make progress toward a restructuring of conventional forces in Europe 
and toward restructuring at substantially lower levels. This is going to build up confidence. It's going to mean it'll lay a foundation for shifting this mindset. So I'm moderately optimistic. I just think we need to speak out, all of us, and stimulate debate. I don't think the people in this room are at all typical of our society today. You ought to come with me and go to some places. And I won't identify it because I would, I would in, insult some of our fellow citizens. But I was on a radio program not too long ago, a call-in radio program from another part of the country. And uh, we went on about 20 minutes, and the, uh, it had to do with my last book, Blundering into Disaster, which is really quite a radical book in, in one sense. And the, uh, the, uh, the master of ceremony said, well, he said, I, I've listened to what you said about after about 20 minutes. I've listened to what you said. I think I agree with most of what you said. But he said, you know, a person called in to me a few minutes ago and said that uh, you are a member of the uh, Council on Foreign Relations. He said, that can't be true. Well, I said, yes, I am. Well, he said, I, I, I should have known that before, and I, I really am surprised and disappointed. But he said it was also reported that you're a member of the Trilateral Commission. Now, surely you're prepared to deny that. I said, oh, no, I, he said, that's a socialist outfit. I said, oh, no, I like to associate with such socialists as David Rockefeller and Henry Kissinger. <laughs> now, this is the God's truth. That actually happened on an open radio program. So, and, and don't misunderstand me. I don't think that my thinking is superior to the thinking of the person on the other end of that telephone. He was conditioned by his environment. I've been conditioned by mine. But I must recognize he thinks that way. And he and I have got to talk more. And you and they have got to talk more. And I think that's the lesson we should draw from the situation our nation is in today. And I think that's the only way we're going to deal effectively with this opportunity that I believe we face. My name is Michael Charney. Uh, and I, wouldn't, I never thought I would be here to applaud you for taking a leadership role in calling for an end to the Cold War. Uh, as I opposed your tenure during the Department of Defense, as, as uh, head of the Department of Defense under Kennedy. But my question is this. First, I have many things that I disagree with with what you said and as you developed your explanations. Uh, you were leading towards the question of mindset and how the American public seems to have a, some members of the American public have a misperception. I would encourage you and I would encourage members of the audience to look to books such as Noam Chomsky's new book, Necessary Illusions, and Michael Parenti's book, Inventing Reality, because I think a lot of explaining needs to be done as to why consensus in this democratic society has, didn't succeed in stopping the war in Vietnam, didn't succeed in getting a freeze passed. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether on your list of six reasons why uh, the Cold War will have difficulty ending uh, is in fact that the media uh, represents the interests of a limited part of our capitalist society and have screened out from the American public a long list of American interventions, a long list of American hostility to unions and socialist governments, and so forth. I'm sure you're privy and people in the Trilateral Commission are privy, uh, and the Kissinger people, to the large number of events that we have involved ourselves in and interfering in the world. Could you step forward with your peers who know about this history and help disarm the anti-communists in this country by telling them, glass-nosed-wise, what we have really been up to over the last 40 years? Well, I, I don't think uh, the media, maybe I read a different sample of it than you do, but I don't think the media have uh, failed to discuss uh, the actions of our, of our government. Uh, perhaps they put a different slant on it. Uh, you read about intervening Granada. Uh, I don't think there's any fact about Granada that the media didn't disclose. Uh, I happen to take a totally different view 
of what we did in Granada than the majority of our people do, did. If you look at the popularity of the president, if you look at the public's view of our intervention in Granada, it was extraordinarily favorable. And I don't think that's a reflection of what the media did or didn't do. It's a reflection of the way our people viewed the Soviet threat. Now, what was it that was said about Granada? It was said, now this is a tiny little place, tiny little island, a tiny little population. I think the largest number of Cuban troops that were alleged to be there was on the order of, I don't know, wasn't it 800? I've forgotten the figure. It was a very tiny number. But what was said was that, by God, they were building a 10,000-foot runway. And what would they do with a 10,000-foot runway? Well, Ed said they needed it for jets to bring tourists. God knows they needed tourists. There's no question of that. And you needed a long runway to get the jets in. That was truthful also. But we said, oh, no. They're going to use the 10,000-foot runway to bring Soviet MiGs and Soviet bombers in there. And therefore, we should go in to Granada. Now, true, we said, well, we've been invited in by the government, or we went down there to save the lives of the medical students or some other damn thing. But uh, <laughs> essentially, we went in there because it might be a 10,000-foot runway for Soviet aircraft. Now, number one, I doubt there was ever any Soviet intention to use that runway for Soviet aircraft. But number two, if there had been, I would have been the first to say, bomb the damn things. You know, you can take them out with one strike, but don't go to war over it. And don't invade an island, any other nation, unilaterally. But I don't think it's the media that caused that. It's us. And we're not going to change the media. And if we have to wait to change the media to imaginatively respond to Gorbachev's proposals, we're in a hell of a mess. I don't think we're bad, that badly off. Mr. Secretary, Gene Hartigan from WEEI Radio. If you could speak to two issues. One, the current Soviet-Chinese meetings that are going on, and will it create a thaw? I'm sorry, the current Soviet what? The Soviet-Chinese meetings that are yeah. going on. Um, and is there a thaw that will result from that? Yes and no, and why? And two, also, the satellite countries, Eastern Europe, and do you see the walls coming down, the Berlin Wall, the fences came down between Austria and Hungary? Do you see the Eastern Europe countries being integrated into, with the Western Europe in the future? Well, uh, I, first, with respect to the uh, Soviet-Chinese meetings, I think, uh, in a sense, this was to be expected. There's been movement in this direction for some time. I happened to fly from uh, Beijing to uh, Moscow about three years ago, and it was fascinating to me because on the plane were some members of uh, the Bolshoi Ballet. It's the first time the Bolshoi, or first time any Soviet ballet had played in, Mos in uh, China for, I think, 25 years. And also on the plane were our Batov, who, as you may know, is the head of the uh, North American Institute of the Soviet Union, and Evdyshenko, by the way. And I noticed today that Ev Evdyshenko was running yesterday in that uh, rerun of the race for the uh, Soviet Congress. He is a, uh, he is a, I wouldn't say a dissident poet, but a, a, a quite a free, quite a freewheeling poet. In any event, uh, it was obvious then that. Uh, and these were the, f the first times that Yevdyshenko and Arbatov had been to the Soviet Union as well. So it was obvious then that, that uh, contacts between the Soviet Union and China were, were resuming. And I think we should have expected it. And I think it's good. You, know, you can't isolate a, a major power in this, in this new world. If we're going to have collective security, it has to be collective. And certainly, the great powers must participate in collective security must support it, and must accept the restrictions that collective security is going to impose on all of us if we have it. And therefore, I think uh, for the Soviet Union and the China to be meeting to begin, because they're not by any means going to end the, uh, the break that uh, occurred many years ago, I think it's highly desirable. I think it's in our interest. There isn't any China card. I think we're realizing that. Some of our leaders have said it in the within the last several days. So uh, 
it was to be expected, is desirable by itself, it's not going to be a, a complete change in, in Soviet-Chinese relationships. I think what the next step may be, what I hope it'll be, will be a realignment of Soviet Union-Japanese relationships, and that's going to be even more difficult than the realignment of Soviet-Chinese relationships. There's absolutely no way, in my opinion, to uh, change the Soviet-Japanese relationships substantially without resolving the issue, the conflict over the four northern islands, and that's going to be very, very difficult. But I think it's a necessary move to move in the direction, to, to uh, make progress in the direction that I've talked about, a system of collective security. All of these are desirable. Now, in, with respect to Eastern Europe, I'm not an expert on Eastern Europe by any means, and I don't think anybody in the world, neither in the Eastern world nor the Western world, has really a very clear view of how the relationships between East and West, and particularly Western Europe and Eastern Europe, should evolve uh, in the years ahead. Uh, whether in the short run tearing down the Berlin Wall would be a plus or a minus uh, to those who are interested in uh, reducing conflict between East and West, I think is still open to question. Uh, I would suggest to you that for the near term, and by near term I'd say five to ten years, our objective should be to encourage liberalization within the Eastern European countries without endangering the security of the Soviet Union. And I suspect that that's the direction that they and we will move in. I hope it is. Hello, my name's Penelope Morrow. I'm a student over at the Harvard Divinity School. Uh, Mr. McNamara, I'm asking for a bigger, bolder vision. And I thank you for your vision of de great de-escalation, but I still hear a lot of military strategy talk. And I'm wondering if it's naive to, uh, for us to think about the interconnectedness of all things and of all life, of holding the Native American vision, Fortunoff's vision, the feminist vision, um, I could go on and on, the Russian and Canadian scientist vision who are working together of the global imperative that we see ourselves as one. And we need articulate humanitarian politicians such as yourself to uh, name this vision. And you ask, where does a man like Gorbachev come from? Um, perhaps he comes from the collective. Perhaps he's an angel of peace that is now wanting uh, peaceful relations. Uh, as long as we project an enemy out there, or them and us, there will always be one. Uh, is this too naive? Yes. <laughs> I'm accused of that often. <laughs> no, no, you know, this is, a, this is a very basic question. And it, it saddens me to say, yes, it is naive. And let me tell you why. I walk to my office every morning. And this nation is the richest nation in the world today. No question about that. And I walk to my office every morning down some of the, uh, the uh, through the wealthiest sections of Washington, down Massachusetts Avenue, two miles down Massachusetts Avenue, down Connecticut, across Lafayette Park, which is directly in front of the White House, and then to my office down next to the Willard Hotel. And in the course of that, every morning I pass, at a minimum, 15 beggars. And in Lafayette Park, directly across from the White House, I, I see at least, and in the, in the overhangs of the buildings, those red buildings that Jackie had so much to do with, developing beautiful red buildings on the side of Lafayette Park, I see at least 16 homeless. And when I walk home every night at 6.15 in front of the White House in Lafayette Park, in the middle of winter with snow falling, there'll be a food wagon distributing free food, private food wagon, distributing free food. Like last uh, middle of December, I counted on a snowy night when snow was falling, I counted 50 people waiting out there for food. Now if our people tolerate that, I think it is naive to feel. I shouldn't say naive, that's the wrong word. It sounds condemnatory and I don't mean it that way. I think it's visionary to, to think that as humanity is going to think of themselves as one. I used to infuriate, I had one of God's loveliest creatures as a wife, and I used to infuriate her because I said, Jesus Christ was wrong. We were, were uh, religious people, at least in our own terms, and this would infuriate her. I said, look, for 2,000 years, he or we have been trying to teach each other, to treat each other as brothers. 
And we haven't gotten that far. And when, when you have 50 hungry people in front of the White House, and you have 15 people homeless, and I mean literally homeless. Now, these are people with snow on top of them. As a matter of fact, when Sakharov was over, he came over here as part of a, a group that I'm associated with. And we had meetings with this group in the National Academy of Sciences, which is directly across from the State Department. To get there, you have to walk in front of the Federal Reserve. And in front of the Federal Reserve are two grates. And Sakharov was here in the latter part of November last year, and it was snowing, snow on the ground. And on those grates, every morning, there were homeless people, wet, cold, hungry. And it, uh, it saddened me that we brought the Soviets into the National Academy of Sciences in effect to cross the bodies of the homeless. So we got a heck of a way to go in this society to take care of our own. And we're a long, long way from helping the rest of the world to take care of theirs. What prudent measures would you, do you believe that the United States should take to facilitate the removal of illegitimate communist totalitarian regimes? Ah, that's a wonderful question. Let, let me repeat it. The uh, question was this. What measures should the United States take to facilitate the removal of illegitimate communist regimes? And I'll tell you what I think. We should not take any measures unilaterally to facilitate the removal. Uh, now, before you clap, before you clap, think this through, because, because it's, it's not going to be easy. What I really think is necessary, and nobody's done this so far as I know, a study should be made of all, I mean all, the unilateral actions by the Soviet Union and the U.S. in the post-war period. Do you mean to tell me by your clapping that you would oppose the U.S. unilaterally removing Somoza in Nicaragua? You know, Somoza, I was going to say screwed, I shouldn't say that here, but Somoza, Somoza was one of the most brutal human beings to lead a nation that I've seen in my lifetime. He deprived the mass of his people of the very substance of life, and many of them died. Nicaragua today is not primarily a function of Soviet and Cuban intervention. It's a function of the failure of the elite of that nation for decades to deal with the interests and the needs of their people. And finally, the people uh, supported by others that uh, rose up and threw them out. But it wouldn't have happened without U.S. unilateral intervention. Now, are you opposed to that? I am. And that's pretty damn difficult to say. But I hasten to add, I would not be satisfied with standing by and seeing a Somoza stay on the scene long. And therefore, instead of acting unilaterally, I want to see organized a system of collective security which would act effectively in such a situation. That is going to be very, very, very difficult. I have talked to some of the leaders of this hemisphere in recent months, and, you know, they, they're rather reluctant to do that. Now, you've seen, you've seen them organized in rather ad hoc ways. Well, first let me say the OAS has been totally moribund since Gallup Plaza left, which was, I guess, in 67 or 68. Absolutely moribund, hadn't done a damn thing. And you say, well, it's because we prevented them. Not at all. I agree, we weren't very constructive at times, but neither were the Latins willing to step up to these problems. They're not very effective today in dealing with Noriega. But that doesn't mean, in my opinion, that we should intervene unilaterally with Norway. I hope the heck we don't. I don't believe we will. I don't believe we should. But neither do I think we should tolerate a Noriega forever. So we must find some substitute for unilateral action. Now, the question related to, to uh, uh, communi illegal communist regimes, but uh, I'm as concerned about uh, 
dictatorships of any kind, the right or the left. And I think that the burden of proof is on me, or all of you, if you agree generally with the direction I'd like to see our nation move in, the burden of proof is on us to fashion a system of collective security that will be effective. Well, we've talked about Nicaragua, we've talked about Panama, what about South Africa? And I can name some other countries if I wouldn't insult some of the leaders of the world. There are illustrations all over the world of nations that are operating under systems of government that act contrary to the interests of the majority of their people. Our foreign policy should be directed toward relieving those conditions and addressing those situations. And it's going to be very, very, very difficult to think through how to do that. But that should not, because it's difficult, should not be a justification, in my opinion, for unilateral military action. Yes, last question. My name is Brian Keogh. I'd like to know why do you think the military industrial complex in the United States does not constrain the President oh, or the Congress okay. in reducing defense well, spending? Well, okay, I'll tell you. I don't think so because they didn't constrain me. And I don't think they need to constrain any President or Secretary of Defense. I canceled the B-70. I shifted the Kennedy from uh, nuclear to non-nuclear power. I canceled the Skybolt. I canceled uh, uh, aircraft carriers, airplanes, you name it. And uh, sure, there was opposition. I remember one of them took an ad in Time magazine. Uh, there was tremendous opposition. There's blood on the floor. But we went ahead and did it. The, the constituency of the president is not the military industrial complex. It's the American people. And no amount of money from the military industrial complex can buy an election. And no amount of money contributed to PACs or whatever it is, is so important to a president that he need pay much attention to it. So don't try to put off on the military industrial complex our problems. They're not responsible for it. We are, you and me. And don't forget it. And not just us, but all of us. And don't ever forget that people were listening to that radio program who believed that the Trilateral Commission and the Council on Foreign Relations, which those of you who know about them, are really establishment organizations, are centers that are eroding the strength and the foundations of this society. And that doesn't have a damn thing to do with the military industrial complex. It's us. So we've got to change ourselves. And it's going to be very, very, very difficult. Thank you all for coming here, and thanks to our marvelous speaker for this evening.